Okay, so I'm Victoria Hillman and I'm here with the Photographer Academy shooting dragonflies and damselflies out on the Somerset Levels. The reason we've actually come here is it's one of the best places locally to find dragonflies and damselflies. And, but there's some specific kit that will really help you when you're actually photographing them. So first of all, camera and, and lens, and I'd actually recommend using a macro lens. Now these come from anywhere from about 60 mil to 100 mil, and the one I actually use is a 180 because it gives me that little bit more reach and I can be a little bit further away. Um, this one actually also has image stabiliser on it as well, so that helps if I'm shooting handheld. Ideally a camera that can deal with tricky lighting conditions. Sometimes you can be working in low light, especially if you're out first thing in the morning. But pretty much any camera with a macro lens on, once you get used to using a macro lens, you should be able to get some really good results um, using that. So one thing that's actually really important if you're going to shoot macro, particularly dragonflies and damselflies, is actually a really good um, sturdy tripod. I actually prefer one where I can remove the centre column because that actually allows me to get completely flat down to the ground, nice and easily and nice and quickly. So, so that sits nice and, and flat to the ground. And it is a simple uh, centre ball head that I can move around and a simple panning mechanism as well and the one thing that a tripod will actually give you is will give you that stability so that you can actually um, use the live view on the back of your camera zoom in on that and make sure you can manually focus to the exact point that you actually want to have in focus and that can actually really help improve your images dramatically by using a tripod it's not always possible to use a tripod but you know if you can use one i definitely recommend it because you will see the difference it's quite good to have one that can actually deal with being in wet grass as well that isn't going to rust or or disintegrate on you. So a good a good sturdy tripod that can deal with being left in long grass, wet grass for a, a while is, is, is a good idea. The other thing I actually quite like to use is just a little LED light. Now I'm not a big fan of using flash with my wildlife photography. It can be quite damaging to some animals. It can startle them. It can actually show up in their eyes and and actually, if you're working in really close quarters, what it can actually do is bring details out in the background that you may not want. And if you're working in dew cover grass, the, it will actually bounce off the water and then you can end up with quite a horrific looking image. Alternatively, using just a little LED light, you can actually specifically light just a tiny bit of your subject or just one little part of it. You can be a bit more creative with it because you can move it around a lot more. You can underlight you can side light, top light, light it from front on. Uh, it's actually just a little bit more practical than using a flash. So with all this, I definitely recommend getting yourself a decent bag to actually put it all in because if you are working out you know, in the field and you're working in wet conditions, it's good to have something you can put your cameras in to actually just protect them from getting wet um, and damp working in the long grass. And if where, as we know weather can change if it does start to rain you can pop it all in there and it would actually be nice and dry so you're not having to then struggle with drying out your equipment when you get home Right, decision time, which one do I go for? This one. I'm just going to watch and see what these two do. The reason I'm actually almost shooting into the light is with the damselflies being so completely covered in dew, as the light comes up it actually backlights them, highlighting all the tiny little dew drops, making them look like little fairies in the long grass. And that sounds important to them because as they as they warm up, the sun will actually dry them off and then they'll take to the wing. So once they're dry, there's not much opportunities to photograph them. Actually, what I'm doing here is I'm manually focusing, using the live view, zoomed in to make sure that I get all the detail in the face, which is the important part. And particularly with when you're shooting dragonflies and damselflies, it's actually easier to use the live view and then zoom in because their faces are really complex and you want to make sure that you've got the right amount of detail in their face and a good way to check that 
is you actually have a depth of field preview button so you can actually see how much you've got in focus. And if you want a little bit more, you can adjust your aperture if you want a little bit less. You can widen it a little bit more. And it can be tricky just finding that balance to get the right amount of detail in the photo but without bringing too much of the background into focus. And the one thing you also have to be careful of is there's always going to be more than one damselfly. So wherever you're looking, whatever you might be photographing, you need to be careful not to knock any other damselflies off, off the grass that they're roosting on. One thing that you'll notice when you are actually photographing damselflies is they'll follow you. So if you've got one behind a piece of grass, if you're completely face onto it, it will look at you. But the moment you move either, either way, it will actually follow you around the grass. So if you find one in a good position, it's actually a good idea just to sit and watch it for a while and stick with that one rather than keep moving around because the more you move around, the more the damselflies will actually move around as well. But once you have one in a good position, you can get some pretty nice shots of it. Just spending some time watching it. And watching what it does. And whenever I'm actually photographing dragonflies and damselflies, I'll work with the conditions that I have, so I'll never move any grass or garden around my subject. I'll just work with what's there to try and photograph them in their natural habitat. And when you're shooting macro, any kind of macro, it's really important to remember that macro lenses all have a minimum focusing distance. And if you're within inside that minimum focusing distance, it won't actually focus. And with most, it's about a 30 centimetre ruler amount that you've got before things are too close for you to focus on. Actually, one, one thing that's really crucial to having success with dragonflies and damselflies. It's actually picking the right conditions as well. So ideally you want a chilly night followed by quite a clear morning. And this will actually produce some quite chilly conditions and also the formation of dew, which works really well with with damselflies. Okay, so dragonflies and damselflies are actually best found in wet and damp areas. They need pools of water to breed in and they'll actually spend about two years of their life as nymphs in the water, only coming out when the conditions are just right and they'll come out and that's when they turn into the dragonflies and dragonflies last probably up to anywhere between about two to four four weeks dragonfly damselflies last a lot longer but areas like this out on the sunset levels are a perfect place to find them because they they have a good food source they've got water bodies with where they can lay their eggs um, and they've got a lot of uh, other insects and that they can eat it's a relatively quiet and undisturbed area, this, this area as well, so it's actually perfect for them. The tricky bit is finding them. So when they first start to emerge, any time from about May onwards, they're a lot easier to find as they first emerge because they'll stay quite close to the water. After they've emerged, they actually tend to spread out a little bit more and they'll go off hunting and then they'll actually come back to the water to breed. And with some dragonflies, they actually um, take a couple of weeks to get their adult breeding colours. Once they do come back to the water, areas like this where you've got quite still water and a little bit of coverage is perfect for them to lay their eggs. Damselflies actually tend to stay quite closely grouped together and pretty much anywhere you walk around here you'll just see the damselflies take off around you. 
In terms of photographing them, best times really is very first thing in the morning because they're still pretty cold. They are invertebrates, so they can't control their own body temperature. So you need to be out there first thing in the morning at sunrise, which in June can be quite painful sometimes. Um, but you get out and you'll start to find them. You need to look quite low down in the grass because as they start to warm up, as the sun rises, they'll slowly make their way up the stems. And once they're, they're warmed and they're dried out and they've warmed up their flight muscles, that's it. Dragonflies at that point will take to the air and, that, and they very rarely come down to land unless they're feeding. And damselflies will actually flit, flit around quite a bit. So they'll either come down and rest or they'll go off in search for mate or go off in search of food, but then come back down to rest again. So throughout the day, you can actually get some quite nice photos of damselflies, but that's it. Dragonflies, they're, once they're on the wing, they're gone. Actually, some dragonflies actually roost up in the trees as well, so you have to remember to look up as well as down. Right, along here. So the one we have here is actually, it's an immature damselfly. So with some of them, when they first emerge, they're actually really pale and they get their blue colouring a little bit later on. It can actually make identifying them a little bit trickier at this stage. So one thing to think about when you're actually shooting macro is your background. Now, a lot of people with macro photography, particularly dragonflies and damselflies, they like to go in really close and get all the detail, which is great, and there's some fantastic detail to be had. But sometimes it's actually really nice to just take a step back and show your subject in its habitat. And one of my favourite backgrounds for damselflies are actually the brackens and the ferns because you get some beautiful details where they're uncurling and if you use a wide enough aperture so you still get the detail in your subject it actually you just get this beautiful patterning to the background so it's not a completely plain background and that's actually something I quite I quite like I quite like that little bit of detail in there rather than just completely flat and it also shows your subject in its home in its natural environment which is is really nice. So there's actually quite a nice shot here where you've got a couple of them in the fern. And actually being in the shade, it's taking out all the contrast so you can get a much softer, much softer image, bringing out the greens and then the contrast of the damselfly behind. When shooting in quite a shady area that we're actually in now, um, you probably find you'll need to put your ISO up. I'm currently using 500, um, just with the shade and then a little bit of breeze as well, everything's moving. So to get it, it absolutely sharp, I've had to pop that up. And I'm actually using an aperture of 4.5 because I'm currently shooting through all the fern fronds here, focusing purely on the eyes of the damselfly. So I actually want to blur a lot of that foreground and background out to really make my little damselfly stand out in amongst all the green. It's always good to have a look at the, those images on the back of the camera because then you can see if you just need to move position slightly. And with this one, I think I've pretty much got that position just right where he's peeking out. Finally managed to find a dragonfly and it's a female broad body chaser. Now the thing is with dragonflies this time of day they're incredibly skittish and they've got very good vision but interestingly if you actually creep up directly behind them or from directly underneath them they actually can't see you. So I'm going to try and get up from behind and from low down so hopefully I won't spook her. And it's all about very slow and steady movements. And then move my autofocus point so I can compose her to the right of my shot. So she seems quite happy at the moment. So I'm going to try and go in from the side and actually try and shoot her through her wings. I'm just going to try and get a little bit closer again. Nope, there we go. <laughs> Oh, pull myself out of the brambles. 
So we're just uh, leaving the reserve after spending a couple of hours photographing dragonflies and damselflies this morning. Um, as you can see, it is quite tricky. I would actually recommend starting off with damselflies. They're, they're a little bit easier than dragonflies as they don't take to the wing so readily. Um, but a couple of top tips for you is get up early. The earlier you can get out and photograph your damselflies and dragonflies, the more success you'll have. And you will need a lot of patience. Um, and a keen eye. So once you start getting your eye in, you will see a lot more, but it, patience is the key. And just sitting and observing their behaviors and seeing where they go and what they do, and that will actually help you achieve much better images. Once you're really comfortable with damselflies and you're ready to move on, then give dragonflies a go. They're a lot trickier, um, a lot more rewarding when you do manage to get them. But again, it's early mornings and also knowing the area and the time of year that you need to be out at the reserve. Mm -hmm.